Hi there, I'm Katie Wagner. Welcome to Social Media Help Desk. This is the time when we sit with you for half an hour to talk about uh, changes we're seeing in social media during the week and tips and tricks that have been working for us around the agency to get results for our clients. So today I'm here with content editor Layla Hello. and our web designer and developer Angie. Hi. And um, we have a lot to talk to you about, but first we'll start with the blue light off. Um, and they, they did away with the trends panel. They've got a lot of other stuff happening. But here's my problem. Not many people do Twitter on the desktop. That's what I was wondering. Why? Right? Most of the peop most people do Twitter in your phone. Right. Right? And so the desktop has all kinds of new bells and whistles, but you may not have seen it because you're usually tweeting on your phone. I don't know. Thoughts, feelings, emotions? I mean, I'm sure there are people out there, but when I think of people that use Twitter on their desktop, they have multiple other screens, so they have Twitter up here and then they're yeah. working over here. So I don't I don't know. I don't know what I feel about it. Because I don't use Twitter all that often, but I do use bookmarks. So I do like that 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 they yeah, kind it's of a highlight bigger section. That one. Yep, it's I've a bigger always section. been a big fan of bookmarks. <laughs> and I do like that they're the I can't remember what it was called, the it, it it doesn't allow it allows you to keep scrolling through the feed and you don't have to have the images load. Like the, the images will, oh. you know, so it's easier to load, it's quicker. So I, I do like that feature. That's like interesting. That I, yeah. They should probably roll that out to mobile. So, well, I bet there's they will. a lot of so, features that they'll probably roll out. So one of the things they say is a big benefit of this is that it runs faster right. than the previous desktop version, which may be because they're not loading all the pictures right. and stuff like you're saying. But if you, you know, Twitter's real time, the beauty of it is that it goes fast and now the, the actual program will load faster on your computer right. and you can get through it faster. So that is a plus. Um, I do sometimes have Twitter open on my computer. You're right, while I'm right. doing other things. But for the most part, I tweet while I'm out and about right. you know, doing things on my phone. But they do say they'll roll out this um, desktop revamp to everybody in the next few months. It's only for beta users right now, and then um, they will roll it out. So it's coming. We'll get to see what you think of it. If anyone's had any good experiences with the new Twitter desktop or, or has opinions, we want to hear from you. So leave a comment uh, below and let us know what you think. Our next update is from Instagram, and people are really excited about this one. Instagram is now letting you post content to multiple channels at a time, multiple accounts at a time. Um, so pros and cons, right? Because you're posting the same content right. to multiple accounts. So I guess if I had a picture I wanted to put on the KWSM account and my personal Katie Instagram, I could put the same picture out. But do I? Do I want to put the same picture on both accounts? Probably not. Right. You know, most of our brands that we work with that have multiple accounts curate them for different audiences, and so you want to have different content going out because you're telling the story differently on each one. Right. Um, so I, I don't know pros and cons. I could see where it would be really useful for somebody like IKEA that has Instagram accounts for like IKEA in all the different countries, and maybe they want to promote the same content across them all, right. and they previously had to go in and, and post them to each individual account. Now they can just write once. Right. Um, but then what about the language barrier? When they want to change the captions to be in the language across all of them? I don't know. I don't no, know the I'm answer to that. I may have just I, outsmarted myself. Yeah, I do think that there is a C translation option. So I could imagine if you are hosting mm. some sort of sale in France, for example, plenty mm -hmm. of people speak French and English. Yeah. So true. having it in English and default into a French translation if they want to, I think that would solve yeah. the same. A lot of it too is how you have your settings set. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if I'm in France, I have mine set to feed me stuff in French, so. Um, yeah, pros, I mean, pros and cons. I think it's cool. My favorite Instagram feature was when they came out with the ability to toggle between accounts. So I don't have to, like, yeah. log out and then log back in. Right. That was super useful. This, I think, has some uses, but maybe we just haven't figured out the best way to do it yet. Um, because it is, it is duplicate content. And one of the things they've been really trying to crack down on is spam across Instagram. And when they spam the same post to all these right. accounts, um, and so this is not the same, but it <laughs> might make that harder. Right. <laughs> right. Harder to crack down on that. So again, let us know what you think. Are you using it? Is there is there a case in your business where you want to put the same content across multiple accounts at once? Um, probably not an everyday thing, but maybe there's times when you're promoting a sale or something. Um, and if you have a couple of different accounts for your business, maybe you do want to put that out. Or maybe I do want to put that on the KD account and the KWSM account. So I, I could see uses, but maybe not an everyday thing. Um, and then the third uh, story we have for you today is that Google is emphasizing product results more in their search results. They're making it easier for people who share products to unveil information about the products in Google search results. 
Um, so there's gonna be a section that's added now that says from the manufacturer, and you can add more details, custom information about the products. Um, and I think it's unclear how much you can put there, but I think you're really, what you're sharing is sort of up to you. Mm -hmm. um, you have more control over the products that appear, you can put pictures in there, more description data, that sort of thing. Um, and a lot of people think that this is a move to maybe start competing in the e-commerce space. Mm -hmm. So if you're seeing more products in Google search results, how long before you can just buy those products right in the Google search results, right? Um, which has competitors like Amazon, maybe maybe worried, maybe not worried, but right. that, that might be the way this is going, right? So they can compete in, in e-commerce. What do you guys think about that? I find it uh, especially exciting because the way that Google is going to be laying out the product page mm -hmm. is all going to be data driven and they will give you sections based on the best quality landing page. So that's something that mm -hmm. we have um, there's a barrier with our clients if you want to if you have multiple products to make every single page look unique and uh, mm -hmm. really showcase that individual product Google is going to help you and walk business owners through that process so now right in the search results you have all that information laid out in such a way that it is compelling for someone to make that buying decision so I think it's very um, small business focused for Google to also allow these companies that may not have the best SEO mm -hmm. and uh, can't get their website to rank for their products that they can now rank because they are the original manufacturer of that product. Yeah, I actually, I kind of like it because you know, so much of our shopping is online these days and when I'm searching for something specific, if I could buy that right in the search results, mm -hmm. I would do that. You know, I don't actually like that I have to click through to websites to see what I want, mm -hmm. right? So I, I would probably do that. Then you don't really have to sift through everything else. If it's mm -hmm. coming from the manufacturer, you're probably going to take it for what it's worth and not have to right. dig around and look for that same information somewhere else. Yeah, the, uh, the markups, right? Right, right, for sure. <laughs> you can just get it straight from the source. So that's an interesting one. If you have a product for your business, this is something that maybe you should consider. Mm -hmm. You know, building out those product pages a little bit more. And like Layla says, they're gonna give you lots of help doing it. So you don't have to be a designer to know how to, to fix that, but um, could help get a lot more attention for your products and, and drive traffic back to your website. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times we help our clients drive traffic to their website. And there are a lot of ways that you can do that. One of the, the biggest ways we do it is through digital ads. Right? So Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, Twitter ads, Pinterest ads, you name it, they all have ads, uh, Instagram ads. Um, so we do a lot of that and, and we try to get people to click on the ads and then go back to the website and, and either purchase whatever it is for e-commerce clients or a lot of our clients are doing lead generation. So we want you to go back to a landing page and fill out a form or leave your email, whatever that looks like. Um, but one of the things we talk about a lot is how do you get somebody to click on an ad? And a lot of that has to do with, with the copy, really. Like, mm -hmm. what does the ad say, right? And I know, Angie, you've been looking a lot at, at best practices and, and sort of what should that call to action be about to get people to click on it? Right. What do you say? Right. So the first thing you want to do is evaluate your goals. So think about the customer journey. Like, mm. once they click on this, what do you want them to do? Do you want them to stay on the page? Do you want them to go to the contact form and fill it out? You need to think about... <coughs> Um, what creates the most value for you as a, cu as a customer from the audience's point of view. Mm -hmm. so, so that's number one. Number okay. two is I would say think of what you want them to do once they get on there, once they see your ad. So they're coming in blind. They see this beautiful ad. You're telling them what they need to do. So if you're you know, a gym and you're offering new classes for the new year, maybe you're saying, you know, contact us for a free membership or think about what the action verb Sign is. up for a trial. Right. Mm -hmm. So you want to th really direct your audience into what that ad's about and allow them to click through to it. And then another thing is an incentive. So think about something that is of value that you can bring to, to the audience so that they're seeing, they could be seeing a bunch of other ads from all of your other competitors. So you mm -hmm. need to stand out um, a little bit more than them and yeah. so I think an, an example of this too is not only do we do call to actions and ads we actually put a call to action at the end of all of our blogs right mm -hmm. and so like we offer our our incentive a lot of times is you know a free website audit or a free brainstorming session so it doesn't really necessarily have to be you know a free website website <laughs> you know it doesn't have to be anything free but I think people like being rewarded for actually landing on mm -hmm. whatever they clicked on or reading through and getting to the end and being like, oh, this is kind of nice. So, yeah. Well, you see that a lot with like coupons being offered, right? right? Give us your email for 15% off your next order. Right. We do that one a lot. 
Um, or what are other examples? Help I me. mean, I think that the limited time offer approach mm. is really oh, yes. smart. Because that's love sort that. of like you've seen my ads a few times now. Click on it. Time is running out. Right. Last day to claim. Urgency. Urgency, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So those are good incentives. And I think the free stuff is really easy to give away. But yes. you could also, um, instead of giving away free things that cost you a lot of time, you could choose to say, you know, unlock the the, web, the white paper mm -hmm. or something that is of right. value to them but doesn't necessarily um, put you out there as a free service provider. Or a video. Give this your email to watch this video. Right. Yeah, or, a webinar. you know, yeah, download this ebook we wrote. Right. right? You're right. I mean, incentives don't have to be discounts, right? right? Um, and I actually think the urgency is an incentive. Like, mm -hmm. get this before it goes away. That's an incentive, mm -hmm. right? So, okay, so you have to you have to understand what it is we want them to do. Right. You have to tell them specifically what to do. You know, a lot of times we joke in marketing that people will do what you tell them to do. Right. But you have to tell them because nobody's going to think, oh, I should click here. Maybe I'll get a free trial at the gym, right? right? you right. got to spell it out. And then offering them some kind of reason, right? urgency or incentive to do so. Um, and then you said calls to action also are good on the blogs. Mm -hmm. And you're right, at the bottom of our blogs, we want you to do something. Right. And so we'll put it there. But there's a lot of different ways you can use it. Right, them. yeah. And like best practices, not only on your homepage, but throughout your internal pages. On your website. On your website. Mm -hmm. It's really important to, it doesn't have to go to the same area, depending on what you're talking about on your specific web page. It could go to another page talking, you know, the next step on what to do. You know, if you're a certain service, you can go to the next service, or it can just take you right to the contact page, or it can take you to, you know, request a quote, or whatever mm -hmm. that action is that you want to, you want your audience to take. There's a lot of call to actions too in email newsletters. Right. When we when we do an email newsletter, put it out there, e-blast, it'll have a call to action. Right. I think of it as any time we want the audience to take the next step. Right. Calls to action kind of focus on leading them through the sales or the lead generation process. Right? Yeah, we're, right. we're saying, here's something, now do this. Okay, now do this, right? And well, you've got yeah. a kind of path. Yeah, I think even though um, some clients, you know, you'll have that discussion about, I just want brand awareness. I just want mm. people to recognize my logo and to, to know who I am. But even in that scenario, it's still important to say, okay, now that you've read about our team, how about you read about our services? You know, it's, it's still continuing that education, maybe not forcing them to take some sort of action and leave behind their email address, but at least you, you guide them through that experience of getting to know you more and more. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a, a prospect, um, actually, recently, not a client yet, but they have, um, they're trying to build a community around a certain area of expertise, and they're not selling anything, they have no products, they have no services, they don't have anything that you can buy, mm -hmm. but they want people to go on their website and take a quiz. Because what they're doing is actually gathering mm. data about their customer base, people who are interested in this, so they can determine what the right products and services are. Right. Which is kind of smart, right? It's like um, crowdsourcing. Yeah. And so their call to action is just take the quiz. But the quiz is free, the quiz doesn't try to sell you anything. And so we, we were designing a strategy together about getting as many people as possible to, to take the quiz. Mm -hmm. And so the call to action doesn't have to be, to your point, to buy anything. Mm -hmm. Right? It's just the next step you want somebody to take. Yeah. Um, and they're getting, lo I took the quiz. They're getting lots of, <laughs> lots of people to take the quiz. people love taking quizzes. Yeah, they do. I don't know what it is about <laughs> taking a quiz. They do. And then you get the result and it shows you where you compar right. compare to other people's results. And I, I was in. Whatever they're going to sell, I will probably buy. So we'll wait and see. Yeah, and I think that right there would be that incentive is find out how you compare to others right. is purely just an answer at the end of hitting submit, yeah. but mm -hmm. it's a little key thing for them that they can look forward to after they've clicked through a couple of ABCs. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and the other smart thing is I had to enter my email so they could email me the results of my quiz, Perfect. right? It's like a little write-up about my result. Yep. So now they're building an email list, so when yep. they do have a product or service, I'm sure I'm on the list, yeah. right? I will get an alert about that. Which is, that's legit. That's good business mm -hmm. practices, right? You don't have to know exactly what that product or service looks like yet but start gathering data about what people are interested in and then keep track of them so you can talk to them about it later. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, very smart. Yeah, I hope we get to work together so we can help them <laughs> get more quizzes and figure out what to do next. Um, all right, well, Angie, any other last thoughts about calls to action before we move on? Um, nothing specific, just that call to actions are, you know, they're really important and they, they need to be really thought out. It's, it's part of your whole campaign when you're, you know, when you're putting your campaign together, it's probably one of the most important things to think about is the different steps and how you're going to get them, get your audience in the right path. 
Yeah, and I think you're bringing up something important because a lot of people don't think about the strategy behind a call mm -hmm. to action. But it's not, Layla, in your ad campaigns for clients, it's not unusual for you to test different calls to action. Yes. Maybe right. we run two different ads, but different call, same ad, but different calls to action, and we test which one works better. Mm -hmm. Like this is an element, just like the picture in your ad right. or the headline, that that affects conversions, that affects people clicking. So, um, not a bad idea to not guess. You know, try to figure out through research and through testing what the most compelling call to action is for your client. That's my my advice. Mm -hmm. um, all right, and then another thing, Layla, that that you and I have been talking about recently is getting your team at your office involved in helping you with the social media. Yeah. Because we work with a lot of small to mid-sized businesses who say, you know, I don't have a huge budget, I don't have, you know, millions of dollars in ad spend to get the word out there, but I do have employees that are loyal and dedicated and do good work. How can I sort of leverage them to help with my social media? And we say, yes, you absolutely can, <laughs> right? Um, talk to us about what kind of advice you'd give a business owner in that scenario. Yeah, so just to, to lay out like the potential opportunities mm -hmm. with um, a business owner, if you do start to involve your employees, you tap into their network. Mm -hmm. So really, um, the goal on social media and the call to action on social media would really be to engage with the different content that the company is posting okay. and offering um, them that uh, opportunity to share the content so that you get into their networks. Um, the benefit of that is, of course, that you would get in front of potential uh, clients mm -hmm. that would be interested in working with you and they already have that connection with you. Mm -hmm. And you can also um, have your employees introduce you to potential uh, future candidates. Other so employees, exposure. yeah. Exposure, yeah. So those yeah. are really the two main things is, is the network of it all. And um, when we sit down with a business, a business owner, the, the first step that you really have to decide is what is that goal? Mm -hmm. Do do you want to use social media for your recruitment? Maybe you have uh, your Instagram is strictly to get that recruiting, mm -hmm. and then your LinkedIn is really to have your employees guide you towards new clients. So write down what those goals are because that will definitely lay out the strategy that is to come. Okay. Um, the second thing is to then start to find out on those platforms who are your ambassadors. So I know here in the office we have uh, Taylor who's very into Instagram and um, I've personally done a lot of LinkedIn networking so getting me involved in that strategy of hey Layla what would you do to get in contact with potential clients through LinkedIn mm -hmm. and involving me in that conversation and, and letting me in on that so that I then convince the other employees in the company to do so as well. I basically become your brand ambassador um, within Internal. the company. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and some fun things we've seen companies do, um, some companies are out there are setting up their own hashtags. Yes. So they have yes. their company hashtag and they let their whole team know, you know, this is, this is who we are. So if you ever do anything on your personal channels to make sure that you hashtag it that way. Um, and to set up goals. So once you have exactly figured out who you want to work with, what platforms you want to go on to set the, the different uh, goals that you want to reach, maybe like one, in a year from now you want to have had at least uh, a couple, a, like two uh, applications per employee from, uh, through networking. Okay. Something like that. Okay. Um, and then the, th the third one, which I'm sure you can both chime in on, is um, showing your employees how you want to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, oftentimes when we have a client come on board, we ask them, what is your brand voice and what, what, how do you represent yourself online? And then sharing that information with your employees so that everyone is speaking that same language and um, mm -hmm. presenting the brand in that same uh, light. So yeah. I think that's important, right? Understanding what the brand voice, what the brand personality is, and sort of the messaging. Mm -hmm. So maybe as the leader of a company, you could outline, you know, here are the key points we want to talk about. Here's how we talk about it. You know, one of the things, Layla, a lot of clients or, or companies come to us and, and I help them design social media policies for their staff, exactly. right? Because um, sometimes companies are scared about letting their employees um, right on social media mm -hmm. and, and with good reason you know you never know what people are gonna say out there and social is very public um, but you also I found in my experience can't control that right there's no way I could say to you all as, as team members here don't write on your social media about anything about work 
right? Now, companies can say you're not allowed to use the name of the company or, or link your profile to the professional page or, or anything like that, but I've always thought, and I think this is what you're saying too, I've always thought it's much more powerful to harness your employees for good, right? Yeah. Harness mm -hmm. your team and get them to help you right. talk about it. Now, I mean, part of it is being a good employer and making sure they're, they're well taken care of anyway, right? Yeah. Nobody wants to harness them if they're not happy. <laughs> but, um, but I think what you're saying is they have power in themselves and recognizing that and working with that power mm -hmm. is a lot better than trying to keep them off social media and sort of police what they have to say. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, so that is a perfect segue into the next point, which is if you're going to be uh, sharing out to them, like, hey, we want you to be engaging us to make sure that you are also sharing with them after the fact, mm -hmm. here's what you did. Like, congratulations, Angie, you made this amazing post. And because of that, we had someone call us up and say that they want to interview here because they knew you. Mm -hmm. Or um, showing an engagement of, hey, thank you, Layla, for posting this on your profile because some business owner found us that way and they now are in contact with our sales department. Mm -hmm. So having that open dialogue with the team and letting them know, hey, you you made a difference mm -hmm. and yes. um, our total reach went up because of all of you guys sharing our posts out and you know we have our social media boot camp coming up and yeah. it's a team effort we all are writing blogs about it and then sharing it on our personal linkedin because we're excited we hope that people in our network come to this uh this boot camp and it, it makes our day when we find out that our uh connection actually is coming to boot camp mm -hmm. thanks to our post right well, last week uh, during this show, we were talking about how Taylor Glaze wrote a blog post that ended up netting us a client, right? Yeah. The client found the blog post and then contacted the agency and, and spoke to our marketing solutions manager, Wendy, and now they are a client and like, that's how it works. Yeah. Right? I think, um, you know, your people are a really powerful part of your marketing efforts and, and your business as a whole, right? The, the people make the business or, or vice versa. And so... Um, I like the idea of harnessing them and getting them to be your advocates out there. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that you said that I really like is you don't have to have the same strategy on all of your channels. Exactly. So maybe one of your channels is about recruitment and one of them is about your products or your resellers. We just worked on a strategy together where they were wholesaling to other resellers. So one mm -hmm. channel was focused on that and then one channel was focused on direct to the consumer. Right? Mm -hmm. So you're building consumer desire, demand or desire so that you can help promote your wholesalers and here you're trying to um, engage and deepen those relationships with the people selling your product and then here you're trying to just build your funnel of your company itself. Right. Mm -hmm. So just because you're using multiple channels for your plat or your um, strategy doesn't mean they all have to be the same. Yeah. Right? And I think people get confused about that. I think they don't know, oh, I could speak to different audiences on each of these. Yeah, exactly. And you bring up a good point is it goes a little bit further than your employees too. If you are um, actively networking with your current clients and your current resellers and you're adding value, it would not, uh, it's very common for those happy clients to then share your content out on the day that they think that they can add value or mm -hmm. something that you wrote mm -hmm. really reminded them of something that you know they find special about you and they choose to write a review about you on Yelp. Mm -hmm. there, there's all these benefits from frequently staying in touch with the people that know your brand the best. Yes, I think that's a, a very good point. And you know, we've had, uh, we, well, let's, let's say this. Um, Layla, the reason you work here is because one of my connections knew you and I posted my uh, job post and he shared it and he was like, wait, I think I know somebody, right? Yeah, and that's yeah. actually how you and I met. Yeah. Um, and so it does, it, yeah. it works. Look at us with all our anecdotal examples. <laughs> um, but we've had lots of clients that then share our job post or talk about the company, our anniversary post when we hit a milestone, right. that sort of thing. Um, and it does, it helps us spread the news further and it can lead to, to business generation or employee generation. Which is just as good. <laughs> and um, if we're not out of time yet, I did want to bring... We still got time. We still got time. <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's understandable that if you have been around for a long time or if you have a really large team and you know everyone may not be as engaged in social media, that you might need to also set up some sort of incentive program. Okay. 
Um, so this can be um, in the form of positive encouragement, but sometimes offering uh, a little bit of a recognition or potentially um, in some organizations we've seen it work really well where we put an Amazon gift card behind it and we say for that person who is most engaging with our content this month can win a gift card. So um, that type of incentive, I guess, makes it a little bit more exciting and, and adds that, that like layer of competition to it. Mm -hmm. And you are trying to see who can be the top and um, it, 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 it spurs up the conversation in the office too. Mm -hmm. Isn't it funny how using your employees to help spread the word and trying to get your potential customers to do something kind of have some similar yeah. elements, right? Yeah. Like all, everything works on incentives, right? <laughs> People like, do. <laughs> yes, yes, human nature, absolutely. All right, good. Last thoughts on involving employees in your social media? Um, well, a key takeaway, I think that if you are watching this and you have not got a program set up yet, that mm -hmm. it's um, in your interest to now take uh, your records and figure out what are the goals out of social media? Are you um, having trouble with recruiting new talent or are you uh, struggling to fill your pipeline? And whichever one of those two or potentially other things that the power of social networking can help with, figure out what those goals are and bring those ambassadors that are really into social media into a room together in the next month, let's say, um, and get them together and start having this conversation and um, get this blog together and, and, and start going down the checklist. I like it. I like it. And as always, if you need help, give us a call. We'll help walk you through the process. Um, one more thing we wanted to tell you about before we go, and that is, Layla mentioned it, our social media boot camp is coming up in February. This is our hands-on group coaching program that we only teach three times a year. So if you miss February, the next class isn't when? Till June. Um, and so it's about 12 business owners all in a room here in our office in Aliso Viejo. They bring their laptops, they work on their channels in class, and we have classes on Facebook, Instagram and Pinterest, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Um, this will be our 29th time teaching the class over the course of, gosh, more than eight years. And uh, it sells out every time. So if you're interested, go to our website, which is kwsmdigital.com. There's a workshops tab and you can get all the information there. Um, and otherwise, we will see you back here next Tuesday at 12.30 Pacific, 3.30 Eastern Time. Oh, if you're listening from maybe one of our other office locations, um, Atlanta or Vegas, and can't come to our Orange County office for boot camp, you could also uh, join us virtually. So go to our website and you'll find lots of details that way. Um, but we'll see you back here next week. And in the meantime, read our blog. We blog uh, seven days a week, every single day on there, kwsmdigital.com. You can also check out our YouTube channel, which is KWSM Team, for past episodes of this show and our social media tips of the day. All right, have a good week, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye, guys. Bye.